Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Power 10 Live Q&A Part 2. Um, a couple things before we get started. The recording of today's session will be emailed out um, tomorrow, um, so look out for that. And then if you have questions during the session, just go ahead and submit those in the questions panel. Um, there's a chat and we'll be monitoring that um, throughout the webinar, so keep those questions coming. And our presenters today um, will have Lori LeBlanc moderating, uh, Pete Massaiello as a panelist, and Steve Pitcher as a panelist. Um, welcome. Hey, Vanessa. Hey. I can't see you guys. Hold on one second. Hi, Vanessa. I just, of course, I had to find that button. <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Um, Lori, I will hand it off to you to start off with our first question. Great. So we did get some pre-submitted questions, so I have those ready to go. And then, um, as Vanessa said, if you have a question as we go through this, please put it in the questions panel. I'll be looking at those and um, we'll address those questions as we go along. So one of the first questions that I thought was a really good question to start with, giving that Power 8's going to be end of support for most of our customers come May. Um, this one is, how involved would it be to upgrade from a Power 8 to a Power 10? I'm going to give this one to Pete. Okay. Um, it's actually quite funny because I did I did this this weekend, um, probably my last migration um, <clears throat> ever. And um, it's extremely simple. Um, you know, there's a couple of things to keep in, in mind, right? You know, you got to realize that the Power 8 is not going to go to 7.5. Um, you know, so, you, you know, you have some problems with that. Uh, the power 10 is not going to go too low. So you're going to, you're going to match that. Now, the easiest way to do a migration is for the source and target to be the same. Um, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, I'm running seven one on my power eight and I want to go to seven five on my, on my power 10. And I say, D don't, don't make that jump so quickly because then when you do that, if something doesn't go right if there's a problem afterwards is it the save restore is it the migration is it the upgrade is it the new hardware what is it is it the keys you, you just don't know what it is so the best thing is keep it keep it simple um and keep a, keep the source and the target at the same release and you will have a very easy migration you do a save 21 on one system you do a, a restore 21 on the other it's it's literally um that simple and i can't tell you how many of these i've done uh but every one is is done that way um done with with our itech service express formula um and and they're simple and they work awesome okay so it wouldn't be a webinar if we didn't ask steve a security related question to begin so um for the Power 10, are there any security surprises aside from TLS 1.3 and any recommendations for researching that and implementing? Okay, so, you know, the, the, the TLS version really matters on the operating system. So maybe as part of the, um, maybe the question was worded with 7.5 in mind versus Power 10 because there has been some changes in um encryption going from 7.3 to 7.4 and 7.5 so um almost identical from a cipher protocol support perspective um 7.4 and 7.5 one minor detail but let's just talk about them if they were the same so when you go from say 7.3 to 7.5 uh, yes, there's going to be encryption changes. Um, we do have, you know, we, we we built some internal matrices that that show those mappings because you're going to see a lot of the cipher support removed. Um, there's probably six or seven. Uh, so the addition of I think three, uh, three or four, and the removal of a bunch. Uh, so if you're going from seven three to seven four or seven five, you need to understand what you're using right now. So when you go to 7.5, uh, 
you'll be able to see what's not going to work. So the trick is to make it work on 7.3 so you have a stable environment that Pete alluded to. So it's nice and easy. You're going from one machine to another machine when you do you know, your, your next migration. But it's the same similar thing with operating system upgrades. If you have a 7.3 system and you're running Java 7 and it's a hard-coded Java 7, meaning there's a you know Java dot properties file or what have you that's saying you're this is the JRE you're going to use. It's pointing at the Java 7. Um, you'd best make that thing run at Java 8 before doing your upgrade. That way you know it's going to work on Java 8. So when you do the upgrade and Java 7 is removed, you're good to go. Now, in terms of other things that are cool at 7.5 specifically, I'll talk about that because 7.4 has been out for a few years now. So little things like there's a new password level, password level four. Um, it just means that the passwords are hashed with a much stronger algorithm that was used in the past. Moreover, when you go to pass, or sorry, when you go to 7.5, you remember the landman passwords uh, hash for net server? You know, when you go, you know, the difference between password level zero and password level one is that, you know, you have the, uh, the password level removed, or sorry, the uh, landman password, Landman password hash removed when you go to password level one. Other than that, zero and one are the same. The same thing between two and three. When you go to three, landman's removed. When you go to seven, four, if you're at password level zero, landman's removed. So there is really no difference at all. You're just not going to have the old landman pa password hash for net server. Little things like that, nuances you need to really know about. A couple of other cool things sharing or sorry ifs shares you can protect the share with an authorization list okay so pre-75 you would have to protect your directory by way of proper object authority or authorization list whatever at 75 you're given the ability to protect the share itself with an authorization list now all object authority is going to own it anyway. So if you have an all object problem, it's not going to help you. Uh, but still, it's a it is another method of protection. Last cool thing at seven five, um, and and Pete would uh, uh, care about this doing save restores for sure, uh, is that you can't specify security level twenty any longer, right? So if you're migrating to a power 10 say you're at 7.4 on a power 8 and you go to a power 10 running 7.4 using the lick and operating system from your from your power 8 and you're at security level 20 you're going to come over just fine however if you preload 7.5 from uh you know the factory you have 7.5 come in and you are coming from let's say 7.1 and you want to do a mixed mode migration um you know, you can't recover your operating system over it again. You just put your objects in and, you know, you're you're at the new security level there. Um, you cannot specify security level 20. It's not going to work. And if you want to restore security level 20 over a security level 40 system, it's not going to work. So they've really made an attempt to get security level 20 into the security level 10 realm where it's not kosher any longer. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> wow. And Steve, just 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 for a clarification to everybody out there, you know, you, you said that some of the ciphers are going away, I, and yeah. that's a good thing, not a bad thing, because those are absolutely. yeah. So just in case people thought, well, what do you mean they're going away? Is that that that's really a problem? It's not. Those are unsecure ciphers that have become unsecure. Certainly. Yeah. And, and you know. It's, how how old is seven three right now? You know, it's got to be eight years old. Yeah, I was gonna, yeah. I was going to say eight to ten. Almost eight years. I started okay. when it was when it was first coming out. Yeah, so you know, it's not a bad thing that this stuff is going out the door now. Is this botching upgrades for people? I would imagine so, because you need to be putting on, um, you know, the SST lick macro tracking what ciphers and protocols you're using today that way you can plan properly for the future otherwise you know if post upgrade and edi doesn't work you're going to be dancing on demand i don't like dancing uh, i want to know first fix it get it done and then we have no issues exactly as i always say you can't turn the sausage grinder backwards and start getting pigs after you realize it's a little too late <laughs> You know, 
just as an aside, Rick Marcotte and I, after you retire and you can't smack us, uh, we are going to write a book, a little Pete mini book with all your sayings that we've accumulated over the years. That's probably going to be the title of the darn thing. And <laughs> I, 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 I guess we should tell everybody, for those who don't know, um, I will be retiring from Service Express at the end of the year. Um, hopefully, I'll still be back for some guest appearances on webinars. Um, but I'm not leaving the IBMI community. I'm just retiring from work um, and going to hang out in the community. I'll still speak. I'll still write. I'll still blog and um, just have a little bit more fun. So Someone 14, just said they'll buy the book. So. 14 more working days. Sold. Okay, so let's get back to the Power 10 questions. So this is a good question. I'll ask Pete. Power 10 offers main memory encryption. Are there additional uh, encryption options on Power 10? Yes and no. Um, so main memory encryption, that that's really cool. Um, certainly a good thing to have. You know, NVMe by itself doesn't really have encryption at rest. Although some would argue that NVMe does have the ability to encrypt from being able to plug the drive from one machine to another. Um, so that's that has some validity in encryption. But I'm a big fan of external storage when you really want to have encryption at rest. Now, yes, you can put your data into an IS. You can encrypt with the operating system. It's a software encryption. Um, not a big fan of it. I, I've seen it used. I've seen some people have trouble with it. Does it work? Yes. Um, but if you go to hardware encryption on an external SAN, it is just beautiful and easy as cake to implement. Okay, so there was a couple more pieces to that question. It says, is it still suggested to not encrypt at the database level? So that would be software, right? Is yeah, encrypting at the about? database level is a little bit different because you're encrypting your data uh, and then you you unencrypt the data when you pull it back out. So you, de you encrypt it on the way in, decrypt it on the way out. Hardware encryption is, is a little bit different because you almost don't know it's being encrypted because the SAN is in charge of that. So um, there's no application encrypting at all. So there are things that you can buy for application encryption. Uh, some of that are very, very good. Um, and then you encrypt on the way in and out. And, and that's known to the operating system. But when you're doing hardware encryption on an external SAN, you're writing the data and the SAN is actually doing that. So if someone was to pull out a disk, uh, it would all be encrypted. Now, before everybody gets crazy about encryption, um, let's understand that this is not your C drive where you could just pull it out of your PC and start reading it, right? This is IBM I that scatters the data across all the disk units. So even if you started to read something, you really wouldn't know what the heck you're reading. You'd be reading ones and zeros, but you wouldn't know what file it came from or, or, or anything like that. You'd have to be really, really sophisticated um, to even get an inkling of what it, what it is. Okay. Steve, do you have well, anything to add on that? Um, no, I, 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 I like the idea of hardware doing the work a yeah. lot because you don't even know what's happening there. Uh, the only thing I would add is that if you're, if you're worried about application encryption, then you should, you know, from a, I, I hate the word holistic because I think it's quite overused now, but if you're looking, if you're looking to ensure that your data is encrypted end to end, um, you know, you need to look at the entire process and break it down into i say absorbable chunks to tackle hardware based encryption communication encryption are you throwing it to tape are you using tape encryption you know i can almost guarantee when people are talking about encryption they're thinking yeah we're going to do one thing and we're good no you're not uh unless you're taking care of like people are saying thinking hey we're we're good we're, we're encrypted meanwhile 2,000 client sessions are hitting their system right now with unencrypted telnet transmissions. Um, are you any better off? Well, from a hardware perspective, you are, but 
you have to look at the entire solution and really interrogate where you're putting value or where you're putting effort for your value. That would be the only thing I want to add to that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and then, Jerry made a good comment in the in the um, in the questions that software encryption does require CPU resources, while hardware encryption on the SAN basically doesn't. Uh, and especially if you have like a 5200 um, where you have flash core modules, the flash core modules basically are a processor wrapped around an NVMe, and that is actually done on the flash core module itself. So that gives you amazing performance. Go, Lori. Okay. Well, while we're talking a little bit about external storage, um, there's a question here about the fact that, you know, we're hearing more about IBMI and external storage. What has been your experience with that? So you guys want to, Steve, maybe start that? I'll, I'll talk about it as probably the most ignorant person to external storage on this call, but that's okay. The, you know, the, the experts will uh, fill me in a little bit more. What what I do appreciate about external storage, and, you know, I, I, I used to have fun arguments with Richie Palma on this stuff, you know, talking about internal versus external things. Um, the thing I do like about external storage from, I suppose, an account rep perspective is when customers are looking to do something, they have budget for some hardware. Um, it allows you to refresh different parts of your IBMI environment at different times. So you want to go to, let's just say you have a fairly new SAN and you have an older Power 8. Okay, that's fine. You can upgrade to a Power 10 and keep your additional SAN. So you can then stagger what hardware you're purchasing, you know, throughout the years rather than going ahead and having to refresh the entire thing. You can refresh parts at a time. Um, you get the value of encryption on your SANs that you can't get from internal drives. You have flash copy, live partition mobility, yada, yada, yada. There's, there's so many things that you can put on your SAN and the, the I, I suppose the, uh, the, the price you get from a value perspective when you're going to external storage, that is fabulous because, you know, um, there's always a little bit of room to move on SAN storage in terms of price. So I, I like it. I'm, I'm offering it to customers more often than I ever have, just because the additional options you tend to get. That's my very high level commentary on external storage. <laughs> I would have expected you to mention safeguarded copies as well, Mr. Cyber Security Guy. Didn't I? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, you thank left you. Off, you left off safeguarded copy, like for cyber resiliency as a reason. Certainly one of the reasons I have customers that are coming to me is, you know, the cyber resiliency, the mm -hmm. encryption, and the flash copies for improving, but also migration, you know, I think simplifying migration for people that have downtime issues as well, because that SAM migration is a lot simpler. I guess is the, is that the right word to put it or less of an impact on the user is that a better way to say it mostly yes um you know i would agree with everything steve and laurie said um the migration can be extremely simple um you know i i, I did a i think it was a power eight to a power nine migration a while back and all i did was make sure the ptfs were up to date uh on the on the on the power eight before we started and actually made sure they were all permanently applied um because the way machines tend to ipl um uh, on the a side at least when you first start coming up and literally i i powered the the power eight down i took the two fiber adapters from the power eight stuck them in the power nine um and and ipl the machine and that was it and and that was the entire migration literally we were done in like 15 minutes um and and most of that time was just you know kind of arranging the cards and just making sure you know everything was slid in properly um 
and and that was it that was the entire migration because on the san it sees the worldwide port names that come from the fiber adapters and boom you're done um now i've also taken it where we've taken you know let's say a an eight gigabyte fiber card um and then we upgraded to a new power 10 and we got 16 gig or 32 gig adapters um put those new adapters in find out what the worldwide port name is and then go into the SAN and change the host configuration to the new worldwide port names and IPL and we're done. Now, I still always like to do a backup, right? Just because you're dealing with data, you're dealing with disks. Um, is it required? No. Is it good to have? Absolutely. So from a migration standpoint, yeah, real simple. We've even also front ended an old SAN with a new SAN and um, the SAN has the capability of of reading the data from the other SAN and doing a migration uh, and accessing the data real time while you're looking for it while it's still on the old machine we would be getting moved across to the new SAN and that works fantastically so you know from a migration standpoint yeah Lori's right it, it it's great I also like the ability to put encryption on it which we've talked about um, but I think my favorite thing is flash copy um, I can flash copy my partitions. Now I have customers who take 10, 11, 12 hours to do a full backup, you know, and they do them once a quarter, once a year, because they can't really get the time to do that, um, that, that flash copy, that, that full backup, the save 21. So now what we do is we bring the system down um, and you don't even have to bring it down totally. You quiesce it so you reduce the activity um, and you do a flash copy of the disks. It takes 30, 40 seconds to do. Actually, it probably takes like three seconds to do. Um, but it takes a little time to bring the system to a restricted, not restricted to a quiesced state. You flash copy and then boom, you assign those flash copy disks to another partition. You bring that partition up. Now, as soon as you're done with the flash copy, you bring your environment back up and you're totally running. So your downtime was a minute maybe. Um, now I assign those disks to another partition and I do a full save 21 on that. And it's like getting all the data and literally uh, you could have 30 terabytes of storage and it will only take five seconds because it's just creating a map of the two environments of the disks um, and keeping track of which pages are changed. And, and that's flash copy, um, best thing ever. So if you're looking at power tens, boy, I would certainly recommend uh, external storage. Now, let's take it the other side. What's the beauty about internal storage? Well, the beauty about internal storage is I hit the button, right, on, the, on internal storage. I hit the white button. I power the machine up, and I'm I'm on, right? That's why we bought IBMI integration, right? That's the beauty of IBMI. That's what I stands for, the integration. And, and it's all there with internal storage. And now with NVMe, it is fast. I mean, lightning fast. We put new machines in, we tell the customers, the biggest problem you're gonna have on Monday morning is that people are gonna think their jobs got lost. And they look at me like, what? I said, because they're gonna, they're gonna be done so quickly, they're gonna be think the job, is, the job got lost because it couldn't just, where did my X go at the bottom of the screen? <laughs> all right. Steve, here's a question I think you can answer. Why should I upgrade before December 31st? I hear there's a price increase coming. There is a price increase coming. Now, Lori loves this because I screwed it up on the last one or or, or a different, uh, I was doing a webinar. I'm not sure if it was a webinar with you, with you guys on the Q&A or it was on something else I was doing. But uh, yeah, there is a, Price increase for software and software maintenance coming as of January 1st. Um, from a software perspective, it's, you know, um, that type of increase, you're looking at what, um, let's see if I screwed up this time, 6% on the Correct. software right. and 10% on the software maintenance. Correct. There you go. So that's a little hefty when you look at a three-year software maintenance contract or, or even a one-year. Um, what you really need to look at, especially if you're on a Power 8, is the fact that Power 8 hardware maintenance is going to also be going up if you're looking to put an extended maintenance contract on your iron come June 1st 
I think it's May 31st, where it really, uh, the end end date. So as of June 1, um, the hardware goes up 70. So right now is an appropriate time to be looking at power eight and to have a plan of attack to at least get something started. You know, it's mid-November. Um, but, you know, if you're looking to get something put in place, it's not going to take a couple of weeks just to get a machine in there and have it loaded up because you may have some things that you need to test. You're probably going to be waiting a little bit for a machine to come in and an outage window and things like that. Um, so with that in mind, if you do, let's just say you have a maintenance, uh, your maintenance contract is expiring in December. Okay. What you may want to do, get a three, four month maintenance contract for software and hardware. That way you can buy a little bit of time. You're not committing to a full year. Give yourself a little bit of runway. Then when you order your power 10, you can tack on your, you know, so you can, you can bring it in with a new three year maintenance contract or a five year maintenance contract. And then you don't have a massive rush to get something done before say the I don't know, end of January. So that's that's probably why it makes sense to start looking at that stuff now. And I would also say there's the current incentive from IBM if you've already started this process and you're kind of on the fence, you can return those power aids to IBM for actual real real money right now versus you know Service Express will take them from you for free, mm -hmm. right? But IBM's going to give you several thousand dollars right now for a Power 8. So, yeah, so it's a 4x incentive, right? Right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's some value in making that decision before the end of the year if it's something you've already started. Like Steve said, if you haven't kind of started yet, it's probably a quick rush to get that done by the end of the year. But hey, give us a challenge. I accept, right? Challenge accepted if somebody wants to start the process so okay let's see laurie can um, we take mike's question on external storage learning vios yes so um mike said that he was exposed to external storage on the power eight on v uh seven two and he said as an IBM I admin learning vials was like his brain was transplanted to a foreign nation without any prep. It couldn't be any more different. I smile when I think about it now. So I guess maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, VIOS. And yeah, when well, you it, when you don't need it kind of. Exactly. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I agree with Mike. I mean, BIOS is uh, a foreign language to any IBM I ad admin who who doesn't know Unix, um, and but but the thing I, I kind of want to address on that is you know external storage doesn't always mean BIOS, right? I can run IBM I natively uh, if I need to. So if I, for instance, if I had one partition, uh, even if I was on a PO5 um, and I wanted to put more than 3.2 terabytes. I can put fiber adapters in a PO5 and go external storage. There's no limit on my storage. So there's one thing right there. Um, I, I need BIOS when I really start getting into more of the virtualization layer. Um, and that's when BIOS really helps out and, and is phenomenal. Um, like Mike says, it is a little complicated nonetheless. Um, but if I want to do some real good virtualization, if I want to do flash copy, have a flash copy control partition, have a production partition, and maybe a development partition and a QA partition, and you know I might want to put in direct attached fiber adapters for every um, partition, yes, that's when BIOS comes in handy because you are going to reduce the number of physical cards, both fiber adapters, tape adapters, and Ethernet. So you know, you can fit them in these new power tens that, that basically have a little less card slots than some of the older machines did. Um, so I, I just want to make sure people are, are, are understand that external storage doesn't always mean BIOS. If you just have a simple environment, you could just go with fiber adapters and you don't even need a switch. Um, you need a switch when you're going to do MPIV. Um, but if you're doing IBM I, you just match the 
uh, fiber adapters to the adapters that you're going to put in the control units of your IBM, uh, your IBM SAN, very important, your IBM SAN, uh, and, and it's a piece of cake. You just brought up a really important point while we're talking about Bauer 10 that I think we should touch on, which is you, you brought up the reduced number of slots, which I think when we, you know, has become a bigger challenge in trying to configure somebody who has, say, a bunch of LPARs, right? Because we're running out of room to fit that in. You want to talk a little bit about some of the ways we, you know, we've worked around that, like right. looking at different models, yeah. for example, you know, kind of well, touch on yeah. that. And if it's if it's a um, if it's a 910541B um, and you're a PO5 software tier, basically you have five slots um, that you're going to be able to to put in. So that's that's one pro that's a problem right there because you just don't, almost don't have enough slots. Now, if you're going to do two fiber adapters, a tape adapter, and maybe two Ethernet adapters, that's five right there. You're fine, okay. Um, but if you have multiple so, so that works. If you're on a P10 and you have multiple partitions, let's say, um, that's when you're going to start having some problems because you're not going to be able to fit in the multiple cards. If you want to put in VIOS, you don't have enough for redundant fiber cards in, in a 41B. So that's a problem. Now, if you go to software tier 10, you can put in an external, um, uh, you know, external card slots. So then you can put in uh, an EXMO, and inside the EXMO, you put a six-pack or a six-slotted EXMH, um, and then you could put six slots in there. Now, you have to put in another adapter in the um, main machine to actually talk to the expansion chassis, so you get a net five more slots. That, that gives you enough to run dual BIOS and stuff like that. You can also go with um, the... Is it the 1022? 1022, um, and you can put in two processors um, and only activate a certain number of cores. You don't have to activate both cores, but you need the second socket in place to put the additional card slots in, right? Because you have two PCIe buses inside a Power 10, and they're both controlled by a socket. Um, so if you put the second socket in and not actually use that, there's a, a configuration that has it there, you can handle that. The issue with that is that that machine only allows 220 volt power. So if you're a 110 volt PDU kind of environment, that's going to be a problem. You're going to have to run 220. Um, so there's ways around it. You just got to know the the machines. You got to know what the 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 issues are with every configuration. Nothing's you know, you, you don't get everything for free. Um, you, there's, right. a, there's a plus and a minus with everything, but there's options. Well, right, because with the 1014, you get expansion, you've got more rack, more can power consumption. Right. 1022, smaller, smaller footprint, but okay. So um, there's a question here about the change in the software SWAMA subscription that's coming in 2024 and what does that really mean? Who wants to take that? Let's Mr. Take Pitcher? It. I'll, I'll take it. Um, sure. So, you know, the this was a an optional thing uh, for the last little while and um, Effectively, what you're looking at is converting your software maintenance agreement into a software subscription. Um, in terms of price, short term, it's you know pretty reasonable. If you're looking at long term, uh, I think that the price is going to be a little bit more when you get into you know years six and seven um, when you're when you're spreading it over that type of life. Just just by anticipated price increases and things like that um right now if you're locked in let's just say you bought a power 10 last month okay and you're locked into a five-year maintenance agreement you're locked into a five-year maintenance agreement you do not go to the subscription model right away um however on the next iteration in 20 whatever it is 2029 
28. What is this? 2023. My God. So 2028, <laughs> five years down the road. You can tell my three copies haven't really hit me yet. Um, <laughs> then at that point, you would have to go and do a, you know, a software uh, subscription model where it is, you know, uh, and that's where a lot of businesses are going. It looks, it looks good from an accounting perspective. In the end, I don't think that you're gonna, you're not going to lose anything. The value of what you're getting is going to be, you know, um, you'll be paying for it. You know, even a three-year subscription, you're paying once a year, I do believe. Um, so it's almost like a yearly maintenance, um, although it is deemed a subscription in IBM's eyes. So I'm not an accountant, but I would argue that that's probably looks, you know, some accountants like, you know, the difference between a capital cost versus an operating cost and a subscription would look a little bit better from an accounting perspective. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure about anything else and it's really customer facing. That's important. Uh, Pete, do you have anything to add on that? I think you covered it. Yeah. Okay. So um, here's a question. How does the BMC authentication work and why is that important? You want me to take the BMC, Steve? Well, one hundred percent. I kind of, I, I kind of see that from your face. Um, so, <laughs> you know me at HMCs. You know, when it comes to that sort of thing, I'm like, uh, get me onto the box, and I'm happy. You know. <laughs> so the the BMC has been enhanced both in the HMC, and you'll find that on the CR2 HMC, as well as on. Um, the FSP, um, and they're both using uh, the Open BN, Open BMC. Now, the BMC stands for Big Man in Charge. Uh, no, actually, it doesn't stand for Big Man in Charge. Um, it's the Base Management Console, and I think, and we set them up when we do an install. Uh, my guys set them up every time because. Uh, we want a, a dedicated port on the HMC. Actually, um, if you've been to any of our sessions and, and probably even at uh, our iAdmin sessions, we, we did some sessions on the HMC and you can actually see we had a, 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 a picture in one of the sessions that showed you where the BMC port was and you plug an Ethernet port into it and you configure it. Now, when you're in that, you're actually below the the HMC, you're actually into the firmware uh, and you have amazing capabilities because you can access the console, you can mount a virtual DVD, you can move a DVD from your desktop right into the HMC and do an upgrade as if you were um, putting a DVD into the media tray. Um, and you can look at the console as if you're sitting in front of it. How many people here have done an HMC upgrade? And if you do it remotely, it goes dark for 45 minutes because you can't see the console until it comes back. You know, that's like the old, the old dark side of the moon. You didn't know what the lunar module was doing when it was circling the back. It's the same exact thing. With the BMC, you can actually see that. Now, in Power 10, you have the BMC as well. And the BMC, can, in conjunction with the VMI, um, allow you to integrate and talk between the processor and the partitions a little bit better. And it actually is faster as well. Um, so you have to configure that. You should always set the BMC up as a DHCP. Um, you can give it a static IP address. It's a little bit more difficult to do that. Um, but you do set up the BMC when you're setting up the FSP. Uh, and that allows the uh, machines to talk to it and it'll also allow the HMC to better talk to the, the machine. Um, it'll allow the HMC to better talk and talk faster uh, when it's moving partition resources uh, amongst partitions. And come to our iAdmin uh, that will be happening this winter and you'll find out what the BMC password is, the default is. All right. Um, are the network connection jobs inherently better on the Power 10 compared to the Power 8? Uh, yeah, I, I would, let me take that for a second. So when we're talking network connection jobs, we're talking about the, um, you know, database jobs, 
QZA, you know, uh, whatever it is. Um, you know, when you go to a power 10, let's just, let's just call it a power eight with spinning drives right now. Um, you go to a power 10 with NVMe adapters, um, you're going to get a couple of things right off the bat. You're going to get a massive increase in CPW. So your processing power has increased. Um, you're also going to be running on the NVMe drives, which will inherently make data access faster. So those jobs um, that are running in what QSIS work, they're going to be able to let's say it's a database job, for instance, the latency of pulling information off quote unquote disk is going to be effectively nil. So the ability for those jobs to complete in a faster amount of time, um, giving you much, much better response time, I would argue you're gonna see that across the entire system, no matter what the job is, be it Domino, be it RPG, be it, you know, whatever. Um, these power tens are just performance monsters compared with a power eight on spinning, even a power eight with SSDs. Uh, you're gonna get better performance off of NVMe. You're gonna get better um, CPW. And let's just say you've got, uh, you know, what, three power eight cores on a little S814. What's the equivalent of that? 25,000 CPW, 30,000 CPW, roughly. Yeah. You're gonna get 25, 26,000 per core on a power 10. So you're, you know, you're transferring those things over. You're, you're gonna get a heck of a performance boost. I would argue that, you know, I'll, I'll do the Pepsi challenge with, uh, you know, any type of job on those new machines than running on a power eight. Well, and and I you'll think probably also have more memory on a power 10, j just the way we tend to configure it. Um, you know, you, you, we usually put more, more memory on it. So as Steve says, you're going to get double the CPW performance. You're going to get faster with the MVME and you're going to have more memory and the memory is going to be faster as well. And the adapters is going to be faster and the bus is going to be faster. So those jobs will run a lot better. Exactly. Okay. I'm going to Michelle ask them. Um, good question. Yep. That's the one I was going to ask. It says IBM is now stating that you can load IBM I firmware, QMs, TRs, hypers, DBs and all other groups within one image catalog. IBM is stating that the system is now smart enough to do what it needs to do. What is your opinion? Absolutely with an asterisk. Um, so this is fine to do if you stay current on your PTFs. Um, if, it, you know, we see, we see, you know, we see things that, you know, make my stomach turn in knots. Um, you know, people are on a, on a release and they've never put a, a QM on. Um, and now five years later, they want to put PTFs on. Okay. Well, if that was the case, I wouldn't do what IBM is stating there because that would be way too many PTFs. There's a good chance you may overflow the link loader, um, and, and get a B600 error. You probably don't want to do that. Um, but if you stay current with PTFs and, you know, at, at iTech, we've always talked about, you know, the, the, our PTF process, right? You know, we do them every six months, but really every three months. So at the hands of a clock, you know, like January, 12 o'clock, we put new PTFs on. And then, you know, in the spring and call that March or three o'clock, we permanently apply what we just applied in January. And then in July comes around the bottom of the clock, six o'clock, we put new PTFs on. And then again, in September, nine o'clock, we then permanently apply them. If you do that, you'll have no problem doing what Michelle asked in that question because you can put everything on because you're not going to be putting that many things on at once. Yeah, that's a lot of PTFs, but it's it's not five years worth of PTFs that's going to cause a problem. You're not going from TR1 to TR10 in one release. That's a problem. So I think if you do regular PTF maintenance and regular PTF maintenance in my mind is every six months, um, I'm putting new PTFs on. Um, and, and some people like to put them on sooner than that. And that's fine. You won't have a problem putting them all on in, in one, um, image catalog. Great. So when you guys were talking just a minute ago about the CPW, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about, 
I think we should talk about, you know, how the increase in CPW from a power eight to a power 10 and some customers, they could, for example, reduce licenses. So I have a customer I'm talking with right now who has four IBMI course on their power eight, but they're not reaching that, you know, they're not using all of that capacity. So then they're looking at why would I transfer, you know, four licenses over if I don't really have a long-term need to grow. So can we just talk about, talk about that for a sec? Sure, we, we did that for a customer, what, two months ago, where they had three on a power eight and we brought them down to two on a power 10. Um, you know, it, it makes number one, um long term your costs lower you're you're only paying software maintenance on two cores versus three mm -hmm. um they had capacity already so the necessity of you know that extra third core with that extra horsepower is not something they needed so we brought them down one so they are getting a heck of a performance boost number one and number two we're saving them money not just on the initial um, machine acquisition, but for software maintenance going forward, it's going to be less expensive. So it's a win-win. Um, we were configuring a system. Um, I'll say we. I was there when Pete was configuring a system for me. Uh, <laughs> back you in, were supporting him through the I'm process. I was supporting him, you know, making coffee, his or coffee. Um, but we were was back in July, we were looking at a couple of 770s and they both had something like 24, 22 cores, whatever it was. It was a massive amount of cores uh, on, on power seven iron. And we're thinking, well, we can really just bring that way down, uh, still give them room for growth, still give them a heck of a performance boost. Um, but when you're looking at the overall cost of that machine compared to what they were using, um, it's 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 a no-brainer. Why would you transfer 24 cores from one machine to another when you can replace it with, you know, 10, whatever right. it was? I can't even remember, but um, there is value in doing that for sure. And and Laurie, I'll 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 take it from the other side of the equation because I agree with Steve 110% on what he said, and and that makes a lot of sense. Some customers don't want to lose their investment. Um, so if you don't transfer them, and 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 Steve's right, uh, you know you're going to have the same or more CPW cutting your cores. Let's say you went from three cores to two cores, or five cores to three cores. You're still having more CPW. Um, but when you don't transfer those licenses, then they remain on the the source box, or we call it the donor box. Um, and once Swama runs out on that donor box you no longer have the ability to transfer those at the transfer price. You have to buy a new IBMI license. So you have to look at that cost and the cost to transfer a license may be $6,000. Um, let, let's talk P10s. Um, and then the cost to acquire a new license is $18,000. So if you think that, hey, I may need to add more processors in two years, then it makes sense to transfer those licenses over um, because you're going to justify that in two years. If you think you're going to do it in five years, well, then it makes more sense, as Steve said, to not transfer them over and then have to buy a new one in five years. So, um, you know, not every solution works for everybody, and it really depends upon your situation. And Steve's situation was 100% right, probably right. for 80% of the people who, who want to save money and they know their workload is static. Yeah, that, that makes right. a lot of sense. Yep. Okay. Is encryption on NVMe storage still software? If, if you're talking about encrypt the encryption on the NVMe device, no. If you're talking about the software encryption that you can use in an encrypted ASP of the operating system, then yes, it is. Now, remember, encryption is not encryption at rest on the MVME device. It's encryption so that you can't take it out and stick it in another machine and then read all the data. Okay. 
um, here we go. We're going to change our system serial and number from one we've had since the beginning of time to a new one with the power 10. Are there any gotchas that we need to look out for besides third party software changes? Say, say that again. Any, say that again. They're again, getting a new serial number for the first time. So they have, they've been one of those customers that's been able to keep their serial number. Now they're going to do an upgrade and now they have to change. So now, besides software, third parties, they're asking, are there any gotchas they need to be concerned with as they make this change? I, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to one that just popped in my head here. That's similar. I know that I, I know of a couple of customers that have hard coded their system serial number into RPG programs when they're doing certain things. And when they changed processes broke. So it's not necessarily just third party and keys. It could be the sins of developers from 20 years ago that you need to worry about as well. Um, yeah, most definitely <laughs> that caught them for a, that took it for a bit of a ride. Uh, other than that, I'm not sure if there's anything that's massive um, that you need to worry about. Pete, do you have anything there? No, no and, 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 and quite honestly, you know, when I saw this question came in, I, I kind of thought, hmm, well, yeah, you may have kept the same serial number, but you still had to contact your third party vendors because your model changed and your processor feature code changed. And most cust most third party applications they use processor feature code model and serial number so if any of those three change you would have to get new authorization codes anyway so i i think they may be may, they may be scaring themselves because they've been doing this for years and have always had to get new chain new codes every time their hardware was refreshed right yep here's a good question kind of comment discussion point i've already started this discussion with pete but others may be interested go into a power 10 and v7 are the 7475 requires switching from sna to enterprise extenders a quick overview might be informative so yeah so this must be jerry yeah um yeah. and um um so yeah, and so it's not so much SNA, it's that AnyNet is going away. And you have to turn AnyNet off and enable enterprise extenders. And any enterprise extenders is basically, you know, it's just a point-to-point -point connection configuration. Uh, and you just set your enterprise extender, extender controllers and devices up, uh, and then they allow the SNA traffic to traverse across because SNA went out quite a long time ago and then we started using AnyNet. Um, and now on top of AnyNet, the SNA traffic trans tr went across. Um, and now we have to just go to enterprise extenders. They've been enterprise extenders, geez, I think if they've been around since 5461. So what I would do is I would set up my enterprise extenders, get them working between your two machines at the current release and then once you know it's working at the current release, get rid of any net uh, and then then do the upgrade. Because again, this is the old uh, sausage and pig example, because if you do the upgrade and things aren't communicating, now somebody's got a gun to your head and, and I don't like to have a gun to my head. I was on mute. Shoot. I, Steve, we touched on this a little bit, but um, there's a question here about updating the password level four on seven five, and are there any downsides? Updating the password level on seven five itself. Mm -hmm. well, are, are there any downsides to it? No, there's there's nothing but upside. I would argue. Uh, will you have problems? Potentially, it kind of depends on, on a couple of things. Um, the operating system, I would argue, really, really does not matter when you want to change your password level, unless, of course, you want to go to password level four, and you're not going to do that unless you're at seven five. So, um, when we're on, say, password level zero, 
um, and you want to go to password level two, then, you know, that's a fundamental difference in password um, capabilities, right? So at password level zero and one, you have up to 10 character passwords. You have two case or sorry, you have two special characters you can use. You can have, um, you know, case sensitivity does not matter. So it's very simplistic. It gives your users a lot of runway to make mistakes and pair that with a, you know, a, a max sign value of, you know, no max. So you give them unlimited, you know, attempts to bang on, you know, wrong passwords until they get in. Uh, it's very, very, you can make it super simple for a user to get into your system that way. So when you go to password level two, and you have users who, this is where the, the biggest thing that I find is where users think they have a mixed case password. They don't. Okay. So they're putting in, you know, I don't know, coffee cup. They put a capital C, lowercase, O, F, F, E, E, C, whatever. They put that in there before the password level two change. And then suddenly you're on password level two and you're trying to authenticate using a mixed case password. That doesn't work anymore. Sorry. Um, Little things like that, you're going to see issues. Um, but when you're moving password levels, it's always the same scenario. You know, you're going to print your password level, your user profile password levels. You're going to see if you have any users that do not have any password two and three compatible passwords on there. They're usually accounts that were created 25 years ago and the password has never changed. Uh -huh. Okay. It's never changed. It's never been resaved as a password level two or three password. So will they be able to log in when you go to password level two? No, they will not. So you have to quite simply just resave a new password for those guys before you go to do the upgrade. Um, we talked about LAN manager. We see very, very few of those things because Microsoft has disabled that functionality uh, for a couple of years now. So LAN manager is usually not a problem. It's usually, you know, in any shop, user behavior is the thing you have to get around. Where we usually excel is we like throwing something in there called EIM. So enterprise identity mapping. If you say, well, I've got 450 users. I really don't want to go through the headaches. I don't have a big help desk staff. How can I make this simple? Easy. You have a domain, put your authentication on the domain level and do single sign on with Kerberos. That way, if you can get the majority of users operating that way, and you have, a, I don't know, 15 administrative accounts, service accounts, things like that, that you know uh, you use to physically log onto the system, you do not want to be integrated in EIM. There's no domain account for those guys. Okay, that's fine. You just seriously made your password level change um, way, way easier because you're only worried about those 15 accounts versus the 435 that you've moved to EIM. So it kind of depends on the account, on the on the customer, but I carry that in my back pocket all the time because it takes, what, a day or two to set up EIM? Mm -hmm. It might take a day or two to do a password level change correctly, but I would argue that you'd probably be a little better off doing the EIM side of the coin um, because you're giving your users single sign-on. So if you're looking to make people happy and then to like the IT person, Give them single sign-on and for all of the partitions and um, you become the hero for the week. It's cool. Awesome. And probably the exact same amount of, of, of effort as well. All right, we yeah. got one minute. And, and one Steve, more question. One, Go ahead. one last thing. Um, when you're doing that, make sure you check when you change your password level, make sure if you customize your sign-on screen, oh, yeah. you have enough characters set to, to do 128 characters and never change the sign on screen in Q control. Because if you let it default, you'll always be able to sign on because QD sign on will will uh, will know about the the and adjust itself. Good point. All right. Should we just we're at 1059. A quick question. Not yeah, power 10 more. related, but do you have a preference on a sand switch, Cisco switches versus brocade? I, I I order them from IBM and you can get either one. Um, 
and I always like to make sure it's an IBM switch. It's it's only an IBM branded switch. It's the same. Uh, it's the same Cisco. It's the same brocade. Um, but when it's branded like that, then when there's a support issue, I just point to IBM, and uh, it's never an issue. Well, thank you, Pete, Lori, and Steve. Um, this was great. And thank you all who joined us today. Um, this is our last webinar of 2023, but we're working on a new enhanced experience for 2024, and we're very excited. So we'll see you in 2024. Um, and I hope you guys all enjoy the holidays, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye.